Professor Tom Nichols rejoins us for a continuing conversation on what to do now that Donald Trump is in. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Uh, he is from the Naval War College, but speaks for himself. He's an expert on things of national security, and he was one of the leading never-Trumpers uh, in this last election cycle. You can find him on Twitter battling and making, you know, terrific points. As tenacious as you think Donald Trump is on Twitter, you should uh, look up Professor Tom Nichols at Radio Free Tom on Twitter. Uh, but his lengthy work, I think, is the stuff that I respect most. That is his essays uh, and his new book coming out, which is called The Death of Expertise. And I'll talk to you about that with Professor Nichols coming up in a moment. Uh, due to some scheduling issues, uh, this is a, a long-form conversation because we recorded this show uh, yesterday when Tom came in for last night's show. Um, but it's an original on this Wednesday night, so thanks for tuning in. Here was the headline back in July, Never Trump Confidential from the New York Times Magazine, authored by our guest. And he was pretty confident that this thing wasn't going to happen. So were a lot of folks, and he made a heck of an argument. Here's the latest headline, which is, okay, this is how you deal with it. And so uh, Tom is back to talk about that. Uh, do you reflect at all on you know, just months of writing and uh, what you had to say then and what you've had to say now? It, yeah, I mean, it was... I mean, you know, it was not, a, of course. What a dumb question. It, it was a tiring election because uh, in addition to the normal political disagreements you had with people, um, you, you were disagreeing with people about kind of what, what's true and what's not true because there was a lot of misinformation and a lot of bad information uh, flying around the airwaves. Um, when I wrote the piece in the New York Times last summer, I said, well, this is, it was more of a kind of a, my internal sort of, this is why I feel the way I do. I wasn't really making the case against uh, Donald Trump in that piece. I was simply saying, this is why somebody like me who comes from the background I do from Western Massachusetts, uh, growing up in a working class family where you would think I would have been a kind of natural Trump voter, uh, why I couldn't get there. I wrote the piece in the New York Daily News uh, because I was disturbed by the people saying things like, not my president, not my commander in chief. The fact of the matter is, uh, the most important thing about an American election is when it's over, we have to accept the result and we have to respect the office of the presidency. And that was the argument I was making, that to say that, look, no matter what you think of how Donald Trump conducted um, this campaign, of course, I only speak for myself here anytime I'm talking with you, um, that as awful a campaign as he ran, um, you, you, me, every voter, we have to be better citizens about this and we have to say, look, the presidency is an office independent of the person who's in it. We have to respect that office. Well, the, you know, the, the, the woe is me. We've had a handful of shows already since the election from the woe is me crowd and, mm. and they suggest that it's insulting to, to say woe is me, that there are some significant worries. The Muslim community has significant worries. The gay community says that they have significant worries. The faith community suggests that you know, looking after these communities, it's um, it's a it's a it's a significant worry. Uh, are you significantly worried for any specific group at all? Sure, um, I'm worried about the fact that the first fight that the president-elect picked was with the press and the media, which I find disturbing because the fact of the matter is, whatever your complaints about the media, and everybody has complaints about the media, uh, a free press is a foundation of American democracy. Uh, I'm concerned about foreign policy. I'm concerned about, uh, yes, I'm concerned about the, the safety of uh, Muslims in America and, and of immigrants and of people of color. I think that these are all reasonable concerns. With all of that said, I believe that the constitutional mechanisms of our government are stronger than any one person. And I think the people who are coming out and saying this is the end of the world, that you know we can never recover from this, to me, that's a lack of faith in our constitutional mechanisms, our democratic culture, our vibrant media, or people, or, our, as we're or, 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 demonstrating or, right here. Or lack of understanding. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I, I, I really found to be really horrifying in this election is the lack of, of, of civics, knowledge, government, uh, the, whole, the whole bit, by the candidate himself, yeah. all the way on down. Um, to his followers. There was a totalitarian aspect flavor to this whole thing that I, I felt was completely dangerous but also phony in a sense that this guy, uh, I don't know, did he not know 
what the limits of the presidency are while he was running? Is he learning about that now? I'm I, not I think, sure. You know, I share that feeling because there were so many times during the campaign where the candidate, when, when candidate Trump would say, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and people like me who are political scientists or people who understand the Constitution or people that have had a civics course, you don't even need to be a political science, scientist, would say, Okay, that's impossible. You're not. That's not going to happen. But you can't is, do that. You can't do that. Right. Um, with that said, when you asked, did he not know? I think again, you know, as we were talking about in the previous show, I don't think he expected to win. I think he was out there pushing buttons to get a crowd reaction. I think he figured that this would raise his visibility. It would improve his brand. He would eventually be eclipsed by um, candidates who have some political background, and he would step aside as a, as and wear the mantle of the guy who shook things up. Well, the American people kind of didn't get the joke. They they went the whole nine yards and elected him president. Well, reportedly, he had some kind of you know tacit or informal agreement with Chris Christie to such uh, that you know when this whole right. thing I'll be fades, out by October. You know all that kind of right. thing, right? right? And of course, Chris Christie has been drafting on him, and now is more or less in the wilderness. Uh, Bridgegate's not helping him, but uh, it is kind of interesting. Uh, that which was the team that got him there doesn't seem to be the team that's transitioning and then may not be the, tre the team that governs. Or, or the team that's there in six months or a year. I mean, that, uh, that happens with every administration. I think it's especially likely to happen with this one because there, are, there is so much infighting and, and so much back and forth in this transition that the people that are being assembled now might not be, we might be sitting here nine months from now saying, Remember those guys. There are people who are insulted by your, in my previous suggestions, that he really didn't want to win this thing. Because my phone lines on the radio side have been full of people who are saying that this guy didn't have to run. <laughs> he didn't have to run. This was a gift to America. This was a chance to make America great again and save it. Yeah. You're disgusted by that thought. Yeah. I'm, Donald Trump had been thinking about running and has been kind of fluttering around the, the, like a moth around the flame of politics since the 1990s. Uh, he, the, he had talked about running for president 15, 16, 18 years ago. Um, I think that for a man who is about brand, branding and achievement and um, enjoying these kinds of publicity-driven events, um, I think that this was a perfect entree for him to say, I'll run. I'll get 10, 12, 15 percent of the vote. Remember, one of his staffers left the campaign and later admitted, she said, we, he really didn't have any intention of getting, once he got into double digits, he figured he was, he was out of it at that point. But again, coming back to where we started, it's all kind of irrelevant now. He is the president-elect. He's going to be the commander-in-chief, and we're going to have to, to deal with that. And I think the, the endless complaining about he shouldn't have won, he didn't win the popular vote, it should have been like this, it should have, thought, none of that carries any water now. Now it's a matter of how can this administration succeed, and succeed for all Americans, not just the ones who voted. I, I just think that there's a, there's a holy cow factor to this. The, I, I think people at stoplights and intersections, you know, cooking dinner, you know, working out, you know, at the Pats game, whenever it just kind of zooms into their brain, that Donald Trump has been elected to the presidency of the United States, it kind of stops them. There's been the, I didn't vote for Barack Obama, um, either one of those two times, but there was kind of an acceptance that there was a level of stability and competency, and you know, I, it's like, oh man, what's he gonna do? As opposed to, holy cow, not that guy. Yeah. And the holy cow, not that guy, I think is what has a reportedly, I, I was talking to a psychologist the other day, says he cannot keep up with his appointment book with the number of people who actually literally are suffering from anxiety over this whole thing. College campuses, canceling classes, I mean the runaway train on anxiety yeah. becomes, becomes foolish, no doubt about that, and I don't have a lot of empathy for that, but there is this kind of, I don't even know what the word is, and I haven't heard... It's it, surreal. I, yeah, I haven't heard anybody explain the kind of character that he is that we have to get accustomed to, but we all kind of know it. It's like, you know porn when you see it. Yeah. You know you know this is crazy when you see it. I think part of the issue here is when Barack Obama was elected, for example, I said, well, you know, nobody's really ever heard of this guy. He's, a, he's a, been a senator for a couple of years, a rising star in the Democratic Party. But there's also this sense that there is a whole cadre of people there in, in which the president-elect is embedded. 
and that responsible people will be making responsible decisions because again, remember, we're talking about things like nuclear weapons. We're talking about a $22 trillion, $23 trillion economy. So that even if, even people say, well, Barack Obama's kind of new in the job, but he'll grow because there are people around him. The problem is this was somebody who ran against not just Hillary Clinton. He ran against the Republican Party. He ran against the established political order, the elites. He ran against everything except himself. Well, that's, that might make for a great rally, but people forget that the business of governing is making decisions every day. And I think that's what has a lot of people scared to say, how, how does this, that's, this is all fine and dandy for a, a, a rally in Fayetteville, North Carolina. How do you actually translate this into making decisions every day and I don't think that the, the transition team has given a lot of uh, reason for faith about that yet. And I think that that's what has a lot of people on edge. Certainly it has me on edge. And we'll talk about the transition, the Mitt Romney Secretary of State thing and all that coming up in just a couple of minutes. But I just want to remind you that if you're thinking about remodeling the kitchen or the bath, do what I did. She come to the Kitchen and Bath Design <coughs> Center. The project designer will see you in your home, no charge, draw up some plans, get you going, and then you're off and running with licensed and insured contract work absolutely guaranteed on time and on budget check out cumberlandkitchen.com and you'll get a sense of the work they do be right back all right and there's donald trump there's his chief of staff and that might be one of the more sane picks that he's he's made in this in this transition Reince Priebus you know, running the Republican uh, National Committee and the party, now the chief of staff. You comfortable with that pick? It's not up to me. Uh, he's, uh, um, well, seems like a sensible. not up to you. But, well, he's a yeah, sensible man, um, he, but interestingly. He's an establishment of, link. But he's not, not a lot of time in Washington. Comes out of the Wisconsin <laughs> uh, Ryan connection. Um, Priebus is not a long time DC guy. Right. Um, which is gonna be interesting because of course the, the president-elect ran against the idea of Washington. Uh, well, look, he really he, the, gonna have to make the, it work. The somehow. point is, he ran. A, he ran. A, look, he ran on a wall. Uh, you know, I, I'd lay even money that there ain't going to be a wall. No. He he ran on a massive deportation plan. Not going to be any. Of there those. ain't going to be one of those. He ran on a Muslim ban. There ain't going to be gonna, one of those. Not going to happen. He ran on a whole bunch of things that there ain't going to be one. And I've already gone through, even with the radio listeners, a checklist when it be, becomes apparent that this isn't going to happen and this isn't going to happen. And there was that famous quote, I forget which reporter it was, I have my notes, um, paraphrasing. Uh, Trump loyalists... They took him seriously, seriously and but not, literally. not literally. That's Selena Zito. The, Very, me yeah. the, me the media took him literally, literally and not seriously. Right. I mean, our, our GOP chairman, or our Trump chairman here in Rhode Island, Joe Trillo, came in here and he kept saying, Dad, I can't believe you listen to everything he says. Well, well I, yeah, I'm paraphrasing. But, well, that's what we've always done with people who are running for office. We listen to what they say and make a judgment based on what they project they're going to do. Oh, you know, you got to understand, he's a move and a shaker, he's a leader, he's a, he's a disruptor, he's a change agent. You know, the specifics don't matter. And that's another surreal aspect of this whole thing, that the specifics never mattered, and it's beginning to show that they didn't. Yeah, the, I mean, the vote on this, Which I may think, be a relief to some of us. Right. I, I don't think you should ever castigate the candidate for backing off of dumb things that he promised to do that he shouldn't do that now he's not going to do. That's a relief. The problem is... Waterboarding. That, <laughs> the problem it's is... It's a long list already. ...that the voters... Uh, you know, have a real double standard about this, because if when Donald Trump said, "Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna promise to do all these things," and then say, "I'm not gonna do them," they say, "Well, it doesn't matter." Politicians say a lot of things. When Hillary Clinton said, "Well, I have a private position, a public position," they said, "Well, she's a liar, and you can't trust anything she says." There was a real double standard here about basically forgiving anything Donald Trump said and holding and, and leave Hillary Clinton out of it. I mean. Uh, Rick Perry was castigated because he wasn't sufficiently pro-life enough. Marco Rubio was was crucified for not being sufficiently uh, anti-immigration. Um, Ted Cruz, I, I mean, you could name all of the Republicans. What people wanted was somebody who just expresses raw, unfocused anger. Um, and I think that's, you know, to, I, th I think I still am curious about what exactly the Trump vote means, because when you talk to a Trump voter, as we will soon, um, 
and you ask them, what exactly is it you're angry about? You get this whole kind of list that basically boils down to, I just don't like the way my life is going, and I want somebody to change it. Because I think the, the most shocking turn about this week has been the people who said, well, at the very least, we have to get big money out of Washington. We have to get the banks under control. Well, I don't know if anybody pays attention to the financial pages. The banks are romping through the stock market. They are the, they're happier than anybody to see a new administration that, have, that functionally is being run by New York bankers. And if, if, if Donald Trump is draining the swamp, he's, just, he's draining out water in one direction and filling it from the Hudson River mm -hmm. uh, in the other direction. Let's talk about Mitt Romney. Reince Priebus, Mitt Romney, Paul Ryan, maybe not experience with previous, but Ryan, establishment politics, McConnell, Romney. Do you think Donald Trump has been flouting Mitt Romney? Uh, or is he, is he trying yeah. to get more comfortable with making this decision? I, how Mitt Romney does it is, is a whole nother psychological exercise. I'm going to take a moment here to point out the hypocrisy of the voters again, by the way, who said, we want them all out, we want to drain the swamp, Washington's got to end. Nobody was primaried out of their seats, and all of these Republicans were reelected. Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan, who are the, the symbols of the Republican establishment, are more powerful now than any Republican leaders have been in nearly a century. I mean, they, they own the city now. So these, the same people who said, we want all these guys out, put them all right back. Um, with Romney, now, of course, all I have to do to make sure Romney becomes Secretary of State is to predict that he won't, uh, right. because then I'll be wrong in the prediction. Yeah. I never believe You shouldn't get gun shy. Or there's a lot of people that were wrong about this election. Yeah, you know? but I, 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 I'll step out and say I don't think Romney was ever a real pick. I think this was a, I think Romney was brought to Washington, or to Trump, I shouldn't say Washington, to New York, to Trump Tower to kiss the ring. and Well, to, first to the golf to, course, to show, right? And then to come in for dinner right. to show what? That he's open-minded? Or to show, look, I considered him, and I, I, I think part of the Trump campaign's strategy all along, and I think this has bled over into the transition, is to firehose the media and firehose the public with so many contradictory and kaleidoscopic messages that by the time it's over, we're all exhausted. So that by the time the president-elect picks a secretary of state, the reaction's going to be, oh, all right, whatever, whoever. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're all so exhausted but it's such trying an to keep up with it. It's such an important thing. I mean, let's talk about Taiwan. I mean, here you've got a phone call taken from tai Taiwan. Uh, there's a lot of turbulence as to how that impacts the one China philosophy that we have had and the arrangement that we have had. Uh, that's just that's an example of a disruptor. Look, if they well thought it out, I'm listening to their arguments. If they did it on the fly, I'm worried. A Secretary of State is going to have to be out front, cleaning up messes, looking over his or her shoulder, trying to figure out whether he or she's in line. Where will the State Department be in terms of its, 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 its level with, this, with the White House? All of those things are anybody's guess right now, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I uh, have always hoped for a stronger line on China. I've been very critical um, in all these past years in my writing about um, the Obama administration's approach to our opponents, which I think has been too passive and too accommodating. On the other hand, if we're going to change our China policy, then, then let's do it in some conscious way. Because the, again, the transition team's response to this was, uh, well, they called us. All right, well, we told them they could call us, but it doesn't mean anything. But we did think about it for six months. But it, but it doesn't have any, they, they've gone back and forth, and of course the president-elect himself now tweeting, well, why can't I take a phone call? That's all it was. She called me. If you're going to change China policy, you take that phone call, you have your spokesman step out the next day and say, this is what it means. We look forward to pursuing this once we are in the White House, and then you leave it alone. When you, it comes to foreign policy and economics. But there is no foreign policy team right the, now. The 35% tariff, even Mike Pence was, was, was moving away from it yesterday. What are those conversations like? Once again, the voters, as you pointed out, who don't understand basic civics, and I think a lot of them don't understand basic economics, the, the working folks who voted for Donald Trump would be the first people to be hurt gravely by a 35% tariff. A 35% tariff on a Chinese television is not going to hurt you, and it's not going to hurt me. But it is going to hurt somebody in Ohio or Michigan who's trying to make ends meet. And, uh, and again, I think it was one of those things that you throw it out there during a rally and people say, yeah, that'll really make the Chinese mad mm. without thinking through what it means. And he points to Carrier as an example of how he's going to keep countries here, uh, companies here, 
That's a state Mike Pence baked cake opportunity there. State subsidies and what? The threat that UT might not be able to do defense contract work? What's he going to blow up Pratt and Whitney's relationship? I mean, and I had to explain that to listeners. Oh, you're down on Trump. You're down on Trump. The first thing you did is great. I feel great about Wait a second. That's the same thing we asked Gina Raimondo not to do, special deals for, in, for a, special companies. For people that wanted to vote out crony capitalism, that was a straight-up moment. Now, with that said, I don't think there's anything wrong. The first job I ever had in politics was to work on a plant closing in Chicopee, Mass. And I know how painful that can be. When the old Uniroyal plant closed, mm -hmm. and it was very painful. If cities and states want to offer deals to companies to try to entice them to stay, I don't have any problem with that. But to, but to say that somehow this was because of the magical, sudden presence of Donald Trump, it was due to the magical presence of $7 million of Indiana taxpayer money being redirected into Carrier's pocket to stay there. And the bonus that the vice president is the governor of Indiana. Which was not an accident. Work. No. Uh, when we come back, a couple minutes on Tom's new book, which means that he'll be back when the book comes out for the whole discussion. But here's the preview coming up. Stay with us. This is a conversation that will be another whole full program when the book actually is published. But the death of expertise, just the title is intriguing. Uh, you got a minute <laughs> to explain <laughs> the concept. Why don't people listen to experts? Why do they think they know better than their doctors, their lawyers, than teachers, than professional journalists? Uh, that's something that is new in American society and it's very destructive. It's the reason people don't want to get vaccines. It's the p reason that people, when you and I are talking, people don't understand what a 35% tariff means. Uh, you know, it, it's not simply an argument that people don't know stuff. That's normal. Not everybody can be an expert in everything. That's why, as one of my old chemistry teachers used to say, that's why we keep books on the shelf so we can go look stuff <coughs> up. What's different is people don't know things and they're proud of not knowing things and they are positively hostile to people who do know things. And I try to examine this in the book and I look at the state of higher education in, the, in college classrooms. I look at the nature of journalism having become primarily an entertainment industry. Um, I talk about why people find conversation with each other infuriating. And of course, I talk about social media and the internet as I try to get to the bottom of this because if we don't if we can't trust each other about basic information, then we can't delegate to our elected representatives what we want and how to make those decisions. And I think that actually threatens our democracy and is a very, very dangerous thing. Now, we're even trying to figure out what is presidential anymore. Well, that's probably part of it, right? It's this, this really was the first post-factual, post-truth election. With, and now we're dealing with fake news. Fake this news week. is a plague, and it's everywhere, and um, it's, I think that is really going to be one of the most important issues of the early 21st century. All right. Absolutely. The book comes out when? In March? Uh, it's official March 1st. It should ship sometime in February. It's available for pre-order now. All right. Oh, pre-order now. So it's definitely uh, under the tree, if you like. The Death of Expertise. Look it up. It'll be a great read. Thank you, my friend. Thank, Thank you for it. having me, Dan. All right. Final word, and we can back to it. By the way, this is the 75th anniversary of that fateful day, December 7th, Pearl Harbor. My previous guest notes that he too was a surprise attack. It was his birthday, but uh, there were no smiles 75 years ago, a day that we can't afford to ever forget, and we remember the service people who lost, and those who still struggle and fight for our freedom. Pearl Harbor Day, amazing. Have a great night. Thanks for watching.